What's going on, everybody? So on this episode, it wasn't even really meant to be an episode. I had made contact. I watched on YouTube Reels or whatever it was or Shorts or Instagram. I don't have TikTok. I don't have that app on my phone. I had seen a gentleman by the name of Detective Matt Thornton out of Zion, Zion, Illinois, which is a suburb or it's north of Chicago, who he was showing short little clips of people having terrible interactions with law enforcement, the officers being out of line, and him coming on and saying, you know, this this is why the community doesn't trust us, we need to do better, and him calling out the bad police officers. And I made contact with him. I said, hey, I like what you're doing. You know, we, we need good quality police officers out there. We need the, bad, the good ones to call out the bad ones. We need the good ones to be lifted up. And we need, you know, to bridge that gap. And so we got together over a Zoom call, and it was just supposed to be a, just a, a quick, short little meet and greet to say what's up and, hey, let's schedule something for in the future. Um, but we talked for almost an hour, and it was an amazing conversation. And I did not realize uh, his no notoriety in the law enforcement community specifically. It was foreign to me. I Googled his name just a few minutes before making this video and saw the laundry list of his accomplishments. He is a, we did talk about his, his nonprofit on this, on this episode, um, but he's a pillar in his community. He was born and raised in the community that, that he works in, and he's helping inner city youth in his community through his nonprofit called My Father's Business. Um, his story is quite an incredible journey. And again, these are things that I didn't realize when I made contact with him. I just wanted to talk about a short video clips about how he's, you know, casting light on the bad cops and raising up the good ones. And he has quite a story regarding his own personal redemption and salvation and almost committing suicide. And he's told his story before in the past, and it's been several years that he's gone and told these things. And again, it was just all foreign to me, but I really respect him for him coming out, coming out of the darkness and into the light and telling his story and trying to raise awareness for his community, for mental health, for law enforcement, and for everything. This this gentleman is a pillar in his community and a pillar in the law enforcement community. So I really respect that and I really respect what he's doing. And this is exactly the type of law enforcement that we need nowadays. Again, not everyone is going to be a, a community leader, and I understand that. But this gentleman sets the bar pretty high, and he's doing he's doing really good work out there in his community. So I just wanted to thank him. Um, for taking the time to, to talk with me. And I'm going to go ahead and share all of his links and all that on YouTube, Instagram, uh, TikTok, which I, I don't have. Um, so again, these are the kinds of police officers that are out there that are making a difference. And this is part of my whole mantra of bridging the gap. And I just wanted to say thank you to him uh, for taking the time to have this conversation with me and for being an amazing example in his community and as a police officer. So I hope everybody enjoys. And again, hopefully he and I will be able to actually sit down and have a more structured conversation a little bit, but it was a good one. So thank you very much, everyone. Take care. Uh, he threw some things out of the car, right? We're right there. He's throwing some things out the passenger side. They're along the, uh, the wall, the slow lane wall. We're 619. He's throwing, uh, out the window. We got bills of coming out. 619, I copy bills of coming out of the window at 2328. Hello, you can see me? I gotcha. I can hear you. I can see oh, you, man. What's up, brother? I'm, 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 uh, what do we call it? Uh, technologically disabled myself. I'm terrible with this stuff. Look, man, it's, it's the older we get, the more challenging all this stuff becomes and trying oh, to figure gosh. out all this podcast stuff and all that is just insane. How are you, man? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to find a place to pull over here. I'm just running around my city here delivering. So I get, I always get inundated with, with uh, Thanksgiving food. So I just go make some deliveries. Nice, man. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, man, it's, it was good. To, I'm, I'm flattered that you reach out to me, brother. Well, thank you. And like, let, like, let's start from the very beginning. I am recording this just in case it goes somewhere and we chit chat. But obviously, we're just doing a little meet yep. and greet type thing here. Um, yep, I got you. Yeah, no, I was, I think it was on YouTube. I was just watching, you know, mindlessly flipping through some YouTube shorts. And let me back up real quick. I am a former law enforcement officer here in the state of Arizona. I did 11 years, uh -huh. nine years. I was in patrol. I was on part-time SWAT while I was on patrol. Uh, my last two years I spent uh, as a detective special investigations, doing homicide, child crimes, critical incidents for mm -hmm. the department, all that. And unfortunately I got injured couple of stupid things. I made some piss poor life decisions and I ultimately, my career got cut short and I got terminated. 
And with that being said, though, like part of my story is, is I still love law enforcement. And mm -hmm. what I did not realize was the mental health aspects that I was going through that led to my piss poor life decisions. So through, you know, aging and maturing and all that good stuff, I've come to realize what the issues were and I work on those issues, but I've also become a cannabis advocate. I'm a, a, a medical cannabis patient and a cannabis advocate, but I'm also still love law enforcement, first responders, EMS, and all those guys, you know, and those hose draggers too. I love those guys as well. <laughs> but, uh, but that's sort of my thing is that um, I like good cops and I'm still friends with good cops. And I, I appreciate the first responder community that's still out there, even though I can't, you know, I can't be out there anymore. So I know it's yeah. weird, especially when I talk to people who are unfamiliar with me, they're like, wait, what? You're into cannabis and law enforcement? It's like, I know it's a weird it's a weird thing, but it's a thing. Yep. I like, I, I get it. I, I honestly <laughs> do. <laughs> you, I won't even look, look like, think, I didn't think twice of it because it, to me, it goes hand in hand. I, like I'm, I'm not against uh, obviously legal. You got to follow within the scope of the law, obviously, but 100%. I think it's, there's, there's a great use for it when it comes to mental health stress. Um, I really, I, I have no objection to it. That's awesome. Done, uh, yeah, I really don't. Um, I, we had this argument uh, before about the CBD oil and my I got chronic pain and chronic mental mental stress myself. I got PTSD. I, I've I've been the this profession almost killed me. Luckily, I, I God saved me out of a lot of uh, before I made some some reckless decisions that were going to get me too jammed up. I, I, got, I got lucky. I feel I feel we probably walked such a similar path. It's not yep. even funny. Yep. Um, so yeah, I, I'm all for like uh, a substance that, that can help us out. I just obviously I can't do it right now because of the law. The laws won't allow me to. But I would, I would, it would, I would not be. Uh, it's not an option that I would take off the table. Understood. And hey, mm -hmm. when you're when you're retired or your department allows you to, we'll have a bigger conversation. So yeah, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a few guys on our PD that that agree with that. Like especially for me, for me, it's the. A lot of it, it's probably 50 50. Like the, 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 my chronic pain, I got a lot of injuries because yeah. of I, my one outlet was to beat the heck out of my body. No. That was my stress reliever. I played semi pro football until I was way too old. And I <laughs> was a full time Golden Gloves uh, in a Golden Gloves gym till I was way too old. And, and I did some damage to myself. So the chronic pain, but, but, but if I didn't do that damage, I probably wouldn't even have survived. Um, I, you wouldn't outlet. have survived mentally. You wouldn't have survived physically. Yeah, yeah no, I, yeah. I get that. And, and that's the sort of thing where part of my podcast and, and what we're doing right now is we're coming together uh -huh. and I, I'm a cannabis advocate and I work with, uh, there's a, uh, Arizona normal and which is the national organization to reform marijuana laws. But my side project away from that is a, this podcast blue, blue to green mm -hmm. and B mental mm -hmm. health and trauma. And I'm working with, uh, several former police officers here in the state of Arizona. Now there's an, a new group starting up called in the line of duty AZ. And it's about getting first responders, not just cops, but EMS firefighters, you know, anybody who's had works in that mental health services, whether it be through the new and emerging ketamine uh, treatments, mm -hmm. you know, or whether it's through traditional uh, talk therapy or EMDR, whatever the case is. But yeah, that's one of my goals is mental health and as I've said, is that I still have a love for law enforcement and I want the officers that are out there to be the biggest, baddest, smartest, most resilient cops out there on the planet and to be able to deal mm -hmm. with what they're going through. So I don't want to, I don't want to totally, totally, um, you know, uh, what's wrong for take over this entire conversation. I'd love to hear about you and what you're doing and what you're, what you're talking about and what you're showing on, on YouTube and all that type of stuff. You would mind introducing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would, I, I walk the same path, kind of the same path you did. I have this, this, I look back at um, what I wasn't told getting into this profession and the fact that I grew up in the city that I police in and it really affected me mentally. A lot of the, the bad tactics and the bad and, and just the foolery no. and this, this, no. this cancerous um, culture that we allowed to exist. Um, that's really what I think led a lot of, led me down a path a lot of my mental health issues because i felt um trapped like man like it's really this bad cops are can really be this bogus and this is really what's what's allowed and what's people are are uh allowing in this blue this blue culture and right. uh it really right. it really sent me on a on a spiral so now 
that I look back, it really, it makes me mad. It, I use that as motivation. I'm like, man, this would almost kill me. I'm going to speak out as much as I can about the nonsense and, until we get this dinosaur culture yeah. and, and this, this ridiculous, uh, what we put up with, just get it. I don't, I just want it gone. Like, man, just start fresh. And, and, and really that's what leads most into this darkness, this mental health nonsense. And it's never talked about like yep. the, the fact yep. that we lose more cops to suicide than we do to violence and gang members shooting at us um, every single year. It should be the first thing on every application to even become a cop it should be the front line, like like right on top. OK, this this job, like like a warning on cigarette boxes, this should be a warning on this application that could lead to mental health stress. And uh, we are we are our own, our own uh, most dangerous enemy is ourselves. And that's the one of the things that I just had a meeting the other day with several former officers who have are, have gone through horrific incidents. And that's mm -hmm. exactly the thing we were talking about is um, getting into the police academies and talking to these people, you know, talking to the young recruits and also the older ones who have been around for a while trying to figure out, hey, how can we you know, help you mentally? But I, I, I said that, you know, stop and think about when did you what age did you enter law enforcement? I got in when I was 28. Okay, so you were a tiny bit older than most people. Mm -hmm. I was 24. Mm -hmm. I was fresh out of the military. And I mean, stop and remember remember what you were like. All you wanted to do was get that badge, get that gun, get that patrol car, and go out and save the world. You know, yeah. you wanted to go – you didn't uh – -huh. like you heard the people talking about, yeah, you're going to see whatever, whatever, whatever. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And then, you know, as you go through your career, like, oh, shit, I'm not fine. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm dealing with some stuff. <laughs> See, I was a little, I, the reason I got the job, I, I grew up, I didn't like police. I, I would, police were, were, I didn't have any positive thoughts about them. I, I barely passed high school and I had really no other alternatives. I was working a blue collar. I never went to the military, never did any of that stuff. So I figured I had no future anyway. I, I had a criminal record. I got charged with packing an illegal pistol when I was a youngster. Oh, wow. And, wow. Uh, and I just figured, you know, what? I'll be a $12 an hour guy for the rest of my life. I was content with it, check to check with two kids. And I saw the ad in the paper to get this job. And, I, it, and now all of a sudden, boom, I'm making four or five times as much money as I ever dreamt of. Um, that was like the world to me. And but the mental health side just crept up on me. Yeah. And yeah. it was either, OK, do I go back to being just a check to check guy? It was kind of a hard balancing act. And um, that's what I, en I ended up just sticking it out, uh, which and it almost killed me. <laughs> So, so what's, what city agency are you with? You're with, a, you're in, you're in Illinois. I know yep, that I'm works. in Zion. Okay. Yep, I mean, it's a, what, they consider us Chicago land, like the big, big, bigger metropolitan area gotcha. around Chicago. So they, when, when we say Chicago land is different than Chicago, obviously um, my city is about, it's up the highway from Chicago. It's North of there, but my city is predominantly when, when they tore down all the, uh, the projects that are notorious Cabrini Greens, the Rogers Park, the Ida B. Wells projects in, in Chicago years ago, they didn't, they displaced everyone outwards. Okay. So that's why the, the Chicago land and the suburbs, it, it, they get destroyed by uh, a lot of the housing that, that, that's got the Chicago element. So gotcha. my city, gotcha. my city in particular, we have over, I think, 35% of the entire county's uh, Section 8 okay. in our our one tiny little 25,000 population city. Oh, wow. So like, like 60, some 60, 70 percent of my city is just housing. So it's a uh, we're for a small city. We we're as violent as they can be now. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it's 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 that's a little bit about the, the demographics in my city. But at the same time, I love my city. This is where I grew up. Right. Like I grew up. I'm, I'm part literally parked right down the street from where I grew up. Um, so that, that it's uh, my story is a little. A, a little different than let's say uh uh like a bigger city cop or or, or something like that um i was gonna tell you, you are you out of, you were in phoenix i mean it, I, i'm in a suburb of phoenix it, i'm in what's called um uh queen queen creek santan valley area so we're about 45 minutes to an hour from mace or from uh okay. from queen, or mace phoenix proper i should say oh okay okay so it was a guy years ago. I, I did a i don't know if i was on i was i was on a tv show or i was on a, a podcast or something but it was a guy from Phoenix, I think, reached out to me, and uh, he was a big mental health advocate guy because he had been he had been involved in a, a several bad shootings or um, not not bad like like bad cop shoot, but like just understood tra traumatic yep. shootings. He's the one who recommended that EMDR to me, and nice. that that stuff's life that stuff that's life altering. That was one of the best things I've ever done. That's awesome. 
Um, so yeah, that's that's my little connection to Arizona out there. I, I really don't. I couldn't even tell you the guy's name, but I just remember. I never. I never thank him enough. That's, all, that's amazing. Yeah, no. If, if yeah. we can reach whoever that was, I'll totally. Yeah, reach out. yeah I know he's got a. I, I pro, I'm sure I can look dig, dig deep in my messages from years ago, and, but that really is a. I'm huge into to just the mental health aspect of it is because I was so close. Like I was about as close as as anybody has ever been to eating my gun. Yeah. Um, if not for just a crazy, crazy, I, I still call it a miracle. Um, but it was just a crazy interaction one night. I, I appreciate you sharing that with me. And these are the, like, this isn't even where I didn't realize the conversation was going to even go this way, but uh -huh. the more and more you're open about these things and I'm open about my past and about what happened. It's amazing how this is just the recurring theme in law enforcement mm -hmm. and firefighters. And if you go back a couple of episodes online, I had a firefighter, Rick Buecher on, and his story is insane because he actually followed through with what we're talking about. He followed through with suicide, but he was brought back. And wow. it's just, yeah, it's, it's a pretty amazing. I, I got to watch. I saw you on there with a firefighter, but I was at my daughter's volleyball game and I only caught a few, a few snippets of it. Yeah. And it's, I gotta it's, check that out. yeah, please do. And of course that promotes me, but, but like one of the of things, is, <laughs> yeah, it's not <laughs> wrong with that. Ain't nothing, ain't nothing wrong with that. Yeah, and like one of the things that I had seen, I just seen your videos popping up on just on YouTube shorts. Like I said, just flip it through and, mm -hmm. you know, and I watch videos about everything, but what you were doing and you were, you know, you'd post a video of a terrible interaction involving law enforcement. And then you'd post yourself, you know, you do it or whatever it's called, where you talk about like, guys, guys, this is the wrong thing to do. Like, this is the wrong perception. This is the wrong way to go about it. And I really started watching all of your videos and you're really bringing that human element to it. And I'm going to be totally honest with you. I don't mean this derogatory at all. You don't look like a typical cop. And I hear that all the time. I'm, I'm sure you do. And I worked with our gang detectives. And I mean, and our gang guys were tatted out. You know, they, like there were times when before I had gotten to know them, I had actually seen one of them in one of our compounds. I was like, hey, man, can I can I help you with something? And he just started laughing. He's like, no, man, I, I, I'm UC. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. But it was like, you know, when when people who are not used to seeing someone who's part of the community and doesn't look like a police officer, that's, you know, who is a police officer. I think that's amazing. I think that's great. I think that's for, good for the community, especially ones who are being vocal and out there, not just doing the undercover stuff that you never know are cops, but the mm -hmm. ones who are out there, like yourself, that are out there talking about the good, the bad, saying, you know, we need to do better and we need to have better, you know, law enforcement as a whole. You know, you and I both know that there's a time and a place to take care of business. And yeah. then there's also a time when it's to, to be human and to bring that human element to all of it and to have empathy and to have sympathy for people, you know, and to come down to their level. I don't mean to come down in a bad way, but to, to meet those people where they're at and, you know, not be such assholes. Yep. Just be another, be another human being. Yep. Um, yep. that's, that's what I'm, that's what I was shocked that it was, it was, uh, it was lacking when, yeah. when I was the way I was trained, the way that, yep. that they were from day one, it was really, it was bizarre to me. And I, I never really, I never really fell in line with it. I'm like, no, like some of these people that you're telling me are my enemies. Like I grew up, these are people that love me. Yeah. I grew up with them. Of course I'll do my job. Right. But I'm not going to have, they're not, I'm not at war with them. My handcuffs speak, speak enough for me. If they do break the law, I'll take them to jail and I'll do it in a respectful, loving way. And 99% of the time they they say, Matt, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it was you that took me in. It happens all the time. Um, so yeah, I, I, it really confused me. <laughs> it really did. <laughs> and you know, and when did you, what year did you enter law enforcement? Oh, four. Okay. I was oh six. So we're, we're mm -hmm. like, I said, we're, like I said, I've been out of it for a couple few years now. So I've, I've missed this element of social media. I'm just doing this, you know, this wasn't a thing when I was out on the road. Um, but yeah, it's to show the human element side of it. And mm -hmm. when people, I'm sure your area has probably been affected by the whole defund the police movement. And it's yeah. like, no, I, I completely disagree with that. What you want are better funded, better trained officers. Yes. You want community police officers that that know the people that, you know, know who your good guys and your bad guys are. And, you know, the, the sides that wanted to fund the community, to fund the police, we need to have a conversation with them. But like, look, we need to have come to an understanding that there's bad people out there that are just bad, you know, yeah. and then there's good pe there's good people out there who have lost their way. 
mm-hmm. you know, and those, and it needs to be a commonality. It needs to be a common ground and it needs to be, you know, able to come together in a respectful manner. And then, but then there are times when you got to take care of business. Yep. And, and it's gotta be a happy medium. I mean, we take, we, I think we jump, we, every, both sides dig their heels too much and don't want to talk. And I just say, I consider even to defund the police the guys that are against us that I think are going way too far with it. You're not my enemy. Right. Uh, it just means that I, I would let's I, I want to even it, it, it motivates me even more. Like, hey, let's sit down and have a conversation. Like I, like I don't have anything against you. At the end of the day, you're still a human. I care about you. You're a fellow human being. So so that's what we need more of just to sit down and talk a little bit more. Even if you even if you if you you come from different sides of the spectrum. So what? I, that's literally my mantra, the bridging the gap. That's what I'm trying Mm -hmm. to do is to bring it all together. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's one of those things where, where I'm from, you know, it's, it's not a lot of people in the cannabis community give a shit about cops and the cops don't necessarily give a shit about the cannabis community, but it's like, Hey, I've got both ears and and I can, and I've got the trust from law enforcement and I'm building more trust with them. And, you know, and the the cannabis community, trust me, I said, I'm part of that organization. So it's, it's one of these things where we can show the humanity of both sides. And I love, Mm -hmm. I love people such as yourselves that are, that are speaking truth to power and saying, look, you know, we're not all bad. And one of the things I was going to say is is that now, now that I'm out of the game, now that I'm on the outside looking in, I have no, there are times that we've all gone a little too far in law enforcement. And there mm-hmm. are times when it's hard to come down, you know, when the situation is so elevated. But I'm 100 percent convinced that probably 80 to 90 percent of the bad uses of force are cops that are just mentally traumatized and are mm-hmm. just they're just they're you know, they're running on full throttle all the time. And uh-huh. then the smallest and, and, little thing happens. Yep, You reach a lot of that. And uh, because it's unaddressed, it's it, it's unaddressed and it's just a buildup. Like yep. you see it, it's like a. Uh, I, 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 I think it's a, a lot of what you just said, that's, that's totally correct. And the other, the other part of it is a fear. Um, if you mix those two together, a fear of like, like someone that but we got officers from my city, they probably ain't never interacted with a black person in their life. And then they come here and they're going to, it's, it, they're, it's a natural fear of the unknown. So if you mix those two together, that's, that's why we see these mistakes and these, and, and then you compound that with a, with uh, the way that at least the way I was trained back in the day that everyone that you can't see their hands is going to kill you. Yeah. And, and that that culture is the enemy culture. Yep. And uh, yeah, if, if you mix all that, it's just volatile. I think we need to scale all that back, unpeel it and then rebut. You give a big rebuke of certain attitudes and then let's start fresh. That's how you get things done. It just I, takes time. Though. It takes time and it takes an introspective look to say, what are we doing? You know, and it's and the thing that I'm learning more and more is it's also going to take a lot of the ancient dinosaurs that are the command staff to leave. Yeah, yeah. get out. Of, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Don't say say that louder. <laughs> like some of these guys, these are those are the ones that hate me the most. I'm oh my sure. Gosh. I'm sure I get some of the nastiest. I've had, I've had some some emails and, and uh, some messages that just because I simply say that that I love people and I and I want to. And, and we need to fix this because it ain't working. Right. Uh, we got to have like we're hated more than than ever um, publicly. So just simply for saying that and they just they're just stuck in their ways and they, their way is the right way. And uh, and yeah, they hate they hate a lot of them hate me. That's fine. I, I don't hate them back. I just I'm not they're not going to stop me from speaking the truth. They just motivate me. It, it's one of those things where, I mean, how many times can you think back to a conversation with an with an older officer who's like, you know, fuck those guys and screw them. And it's just like, Mm -hmm. it's totally us versus them. And it's like, what happens when you're no longer in law enforcement? There's going to be, there's going to be a huge gap and there's going to be, you're going to be, you're an asshole. You're going to be the one that, you know, you're going to eat a gun five years after you retired. Yep. Because you've made enemies with everybody. You ever run into one of those old timers that that just was maybe a lieutenant or something, and they they're retired now, and they're just normal human being. They're like a shell of a person. Yep. It, it, it's really it's uncanny. They look, to me, they even appear gaunt. They look, they appear like they've aged twenty years and three years, um, and it's from living twenty five years of your life at war. Hating. And not, now now what? Yeah, now what? Now you're stuck in your hate, and and that's what you have to be proud of. How many people you hated? Um, yeah, that's, it's, that's, that's all a product of, of, of the lack of addressing this stuff. 
And, and it's the and you know I'm sure that you probably went through it just as I did when I was a young trooper. I mean, it was it just envelops your life. It becomes your identity. Uh -huh. I mean, I remember you know leaving the house and you know you got to have your gun, got to have you know your flex cuffs with you, got to have your flashlight, got to have this. And I do believe in being prepared. I'm not I'm not against being prepared. I'm not against having stuff like that. Like I do, you know I. I that's totally fine, but it was the hyper vigilance. Like as you're walking yeah. around with your family, you know, bad shit happens everywhere. Yes, there was another shooting that just happened, and you know, I'm not saying those things don't happen, but at the same time, it's like you just got to look at people as people. You know. Oh my gosh, you know, yeah. How many times? <laughs> how many times does one side or the other, you know, lump this group of people in, and then it's oh, you can't do that. You just got to look at them individually. It's like, but then you lump all cops in to be the same. You're, you're doing yeah. the same thing here. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, that, that hypervigilance. Oh my gosh. You, I mean, it just sucks you and you don't even know it. Yep. You don't even know it. Um, how many times you, you pulled in your garage and you just check, check the mirror view just really quick out of instinct. If somebody following it, it, it's just, it's ingrained in you. And, um, I think we just, we, we, we just kind of concede to it instead yes. of just like saying like, let's, this isn't normal. We're not right. being normal. This is we're the ones that need to fix it. Like, like we, we look at it like the other people. You you guys are the victims. You guys are the sheep. You're not normal. But it's really the opposite way around. I agree with that. <laughs> I agree with that statement. And then when I got out of law enforcement, and then I just started being around normal people, it mm -hmm. was it was a totally. I went back to college right after right after I got out of law enforcement. So I went I went to a community college. So I went from you know being around my peers being cops to now I'm like back with like 20 year olds and 25 year olds all day long, and it was a huge. And I was only 35 or 36 at the time, and it was like they're they're just normal people trying to live their lives. I'm the one that's yeah. like you know constantly you know wearing around looking at everybody's <laughs> looking at everybody's waistbands, you know seeing their oh, yeah. bulge in their backpack and. Being that stupid hyper vigilant, and again, there's a time and a place. I'm not, you know, I'm not urging anybody to let their guard down too much, but yeah, it's you got to come back to reality as a human being. Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, you'd be miserable. You just can't. You'll die like that. Yeah, and you won't live long after retirement. Uh uh Yeah, that, that's that's a fact. We live. We we don't live very long statistically. And that was the one thing. This. Yeah. And that was the one thing that I was, I did pride myself when I wasn't still in law enforcement is I had friends that were not cops. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was out there doing my own thing on the weekends and and had, you know, fam or friends and family that were not police officers and, and just talking about work and talking about the same thing and the same accidents and the same brutal scenes. And it's, and my wife is like, I don't want to hear about, you know, dead babies and children all day long. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a, it's not a good thing. Yeah, I'm luckily I, I used to be married to a cop. Um Ooh. not anymore. Yeah, it was, so it, that was literally our, our life. I I bet that saved a, a decades of my life getting away from she divorced me, which is which is which is it is what it is. But I now I have a, my fiance is uh she's just a regular she she's a personal trainer. And she's the same way like I don't have to talk about this stuff. Well, she doesn't even want to hear about it. Most of the time, if it's hurting me, obviously she'll be she'll listen to me. But it's not all day long. Hey, remember this ten fifty? Remember this crash? Remember this death? So yeah, it, it really does. Being around some, it, it's totally changed me. Give me four seconds. My dogs are going insane. Yep. Hang on. Oh no, go ahead. You're good. You're good. Sorry about that. There's something up front. No, oh, and no worries. That's good though, because that'll keep you grounded and balanced. You know, having mm -hmm. somebody, and it have being, uh, you know, getting married to a trainer, you have no excuse for not working out now. So, <laughs> just <laughs> she kidding. Kicks my butt. That's Today's awesome. my two a day. I got two today and two more tomorrow. Woo! She she whips me. Yeah, you know what? Actually, I I'm actually blessed because the organization that I run, like they they, a lot of them are gang members of kids from the street that they, they they don't care that i'm a cop like it doesn't impress them like right that right. side of me that they have they really have no interest in that side of me they love me because i love them but like i'm a big brother or uncle to them so i don't even have to talk about cop stuff that's just like my outlet my family and we like we never talk they'll have a question here and there yeah or when one of the knuckleheads gets in trouble they, they ask me what's gonna happen like uh, and we can help to a point obviously before there's a conflict um but yeah that that actually helps me that that, that i that I, I like it that they do not care that I'm a cop. It's not the main focus of the conversation. No. How many no, of your I friends? Are, 
Go ahead, go, sorry. I, I, I was going to say, I started to tell them, that was one of my MOs, like, or I, I thought that that was going to be different at first when I started the organization. And week to week, um, I always give a lesson plan, and I would have this little segment, I would tell them a cop story, and none of them cared. It was like, right. they turned me off, I was like, they were impressed, like, okay, well, I'll stop doing that, they don't care, I'm a cop, so. That's good, though, because they're seeing the human side of you, they're not just seeing yep. the, the badge and gun walking around. What's, what is the organization that you run? I run. It's called my father's business. It really just started with a uh, with six kids that my son was was gonna come to the church where we have a basketball gym, and and the pastor asked me to start a group, so I started. It started with my son and his friends, and before time, the whole gym was full, and then we 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 just decided to make it official five hundred one c three. Now we're just uh, they call us a drop in center. Uh, it's like a safe place for okay. anyone. We we anyone and everyone from my city comes um, at any given night. Um, mostly it's coming down to just the, the kids without fathers, the, okay. the ones that, that they want to eat, they want to hoop. But, but the main thing is we, we, I teach them about the gospel. I teach them about God. And, uh, then we just walk with them. If they're not interested in that part of it, we still love them and we still walk with them. So it's really safe for anybody, period. That's awesome. And, um, uh, yeah, we got a great team that we get them jobs. Now we get them in the, try to get them in the trade school, college, help them out if they're, uh, struggling with legal fees or something like that we, we we give them the best advice obviously there's a line that i can't cross when it right, comes to right certain information i can give them but we have resources that we can send them to um that will help them and i just want to see them all live productive lives that's an amazing had, uh, thing we the, the stories that have come out of there since 2017 my city has 25,000 people in our my group is i mean we have maybe have 80 kids a week. it's between between 40 and 80 kids a week come but since 2017 we've had uh just in my little city we've had uh, almost 50 of them get hit by gunfire oh. and we've we've had to bury like 13 or 14 now and so yeah that's 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 really my motivation from week to week like you never know you might not see this kid next week so love him the best you can give him the truth to, to, uh as quick as you can and, and uh just take it because i want if it was up to me i'd adopt all of them no, that's yeah, very commendable uh, of you, and it's an amazing yeah, story. It, 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 and it, it's fun too. We we had some great great kids come out of there. Some great that's stories. So what's the like? What's the answer to to the inner city issues? What's the? I mean, what what do you do? What's how do you you know, you as a police that's officer, not, what do you do to to help stop the violence? Or what's what do you do? That's it's uh, it, it, that's that's the uh, the hundred thousand dollar question. We, the number one common denominator for me, obviously, is is the broken families. I mean, yeah. every like ninety five percent of my boys don't have a, a don't have a father or never had one, or he's just not he's just in prison. Or it, it, it's it's it, that's that's actually how they love you quickly. You know, there's a vacancy. They just want to yeah. they just want to be loved, um, and then just teaching them. I, I, it's so hard as a as a as a unit. I like to get individual one-on-one, like okay. challenge them personally. Uh, my key is if you can change their heart, then you can change their, the way their mind thinks and the way they look at the world. Um, and a lot of times, and it, it's just hard work because it's one individual at a time. Because these kids, when they're young, you get them in a group, they're not going to be as receptive if they're right. all around all around their, their homeboys. And, and it's just a fact. So I just show them that I'm there for them every week. My team's there for them every week. Consistent presence. Try to get through to their heart, find out where they're at, and find out what, what they want to do with their lives. Um, and the recipe for that is is that's the best recipe I can come up with. The violence it, you, you're up against such a such a horrible uh, enemy in, in in the culture because when when a father's not in somebody's life, you know who raises these boys? The streets. The streets. Uh, the culture. The music. Yeah. The music is a huge thing. Um, because they that that's who they idolize. Yeah. Now that with technology, everyone can be their own yeah. rap star. Um, so that's what kind of what you're up against. So I, I I fight back against that by just challenging them, um, and saying, "Is this really pleasing? Is this really gonna do anything for your life?" So it's a lot of it is just one on one time to to try to get. And my 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 strategy has always been to go for the biggest, most dangerous one. I go okay. for the top dog. If I can change him, the rest are gonna see yeah. that. So I, uh, that that's one of my strategies. You're not scared of a challenge, um, then, obviously. No, not at all. No, not at all. My my biggest, my biggest, most mighty soldier was uh my hardest one to win over. That's amazing to hear, and I just I commend you for that because 
one of the things that you said that I don't talk not enough about, and I'm so happy that you did, is I'm a Christian as well. Mm -hmm. And that's and spreading the word of God and the message and the love of God is is very difficult in this day and age. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I actually I don't think I've ever mentioned before on my podcast. So it's just mm. but like I have a cross on my arm. I know it's upside down when you turn it, but it, it, it's not. <laughs> it's go. not. But it's one of these things that it's like if you can if you can show true, not bullshit televangelist TV Christianity, no. but real true love of God and love of fellow humans and love of man, mm -hmm. lo love of woman. That's that's a resonating message. And, and that's what we were commanded to do. Just love. I, I think the the most effective thing. I think the way they th that they will respect you the most is to say, you know what? I was broken just like you. I'm no better than you. I'm not. I'm not a, your authority. Uh, and but, but all I did was listen to what God said and, and change the direction of my life. And that's what I want you to do too. Um, that's that's the most powerful thing you can tell them. I'm gonna uh, go. So I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that. I'll, I'll say that for me personally, that message that you just said about admitting to yourself that you're broken and have mm -hmm. issues was it was one of the toughest things I've ever had to do for myself. Mm -hmm. And I, I could go and, you know, I don't give me a bad guy with a gun. That was easy. You know, give mm -hmm. me a police chase. That was easy. But actually sitting quietly with your alone with your thoughts and in your head being, I've got some issues I got to work out. The hardest thing ever. I call it the ceiling staring at bed, staring alone in bed, Knowing what you were doing, knowing that your life is is secretly spiraling out of control, yep. and just looking at the ceiling is just you and God. And it took me so long to come to grips with that, and finally, it took literally took a uh, like a supernatural event for me to finally wake up and say, you know what, I have to get help. And so my, yeah, that's my event was I'm glad unfortunately. Did. Yeah, I'm glad there was. A, I'm glad there was a catalyst. Like I said, I'm, I've been open and honest and talked about it before on, on other episodes of mine. Is that I was stupid. I was in pain. I was dealing with mental health is issues, and I I got into a, a alter, altercation with my wife, and I was mm -hmm. arrested, and that was mm -hmm. my come to Jesus moment. I mean, I was a Christian before then, but I was not living the way I should have. Mm -hmm. But it was that. What do I, what am I doing? What led me here? I've got some work I got to figure out. Yep. You know, I got some shit I got to figure out. Yep. And the one thing that uh, get that for us, the hardest part, the hard part too, is that we're cops. We want results now. Like we're, we're like, we solve the problem now and we move on. That's the hardest thing because putting all the pieces back and getting all the help you need. It's just, it's, it takes a lot of time and it, it takes, takes sustain. And it takes the commitment Mm -hmm. Not not that bullshit. I'm fine. I'll be fine. Everybody's yeah. fine. Uh, no, you got to commit to yourself. We, it's hard for us that we don't, to, to admit that we don't have control because our identity literally is to control yes. everything. As cops, you have to have control. You got to so, make those split yeah, second decisions, and you got to have, have you got to even if you've never been on that type of situation before, you still got to show up and act like you're in control and know what you're yeah. doing. <laughs> yeah, even if you had the BS through it. <laughs> there are many times where I would Man, go I'm, back to my patrol car and be like, well, what am I doing here? Uh -huh. like, <laughs> I'll, I'll figure it out. <laughs> oh my gosh, that still happens. That happens to be at school now. That's oh awesome. my goodness. Are you are you on the road or are you detective? I was uh, I was on the road for 11, uh, 10, 11 years, and okay. I was a detective. And then they put a time cap, and I was not happy about this, on how long we could be a detective for. Oh, okay. um, I worked all violent crimes. Yeah, my chief, it was a new chief came in, and God bless him. I love the chief. It was just a thing. I think it was because there was some turds that wrote it out and did nothing to end yep. their careers. And our PD is small enough where he can just say, nope, you ain't doing that no more. Um, so I had to go back to the road. But then a uh, school resource officer opened up uh, about six months ago. And I was like, man, let me take that because I work with the kids anyway. So that's where I've been since. So I'll probably I'll probably finish out as a school resource officer. Let me ask you something about that because I didn't know you were an SRO. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a big push right now, you know, from oh we need to get cops out of schools. We need to get SROs. You know, an armed cop in a school doesn't doesn't you know stop violent crime. Doesn't do anything like that. What are your personal thoughts on that? I don't agree with that uh, at all. Uh, if it's done correctly. Um, you have to find the right candidate. You have to have the thickest. I, I thought I needed thick skin to be a cop on the road. You need some thick skin to be in that school where you're not going hands on to 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 squash the threat right away. You right. You, you have right. to 
you have to be able to, to, to bring yourself down to a different level. It's, it's kind of, it's been a nice learning process, but I don't agree with that because my presence alone stops so much BS. They know, they know officer Matt's in the school. They're going to, they're, they're going to fall in line. They're not going to be as crazy violent. They're not going to bring the blatantly bring the weed into the school. They're, 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 our presence alone helps a lot, but it, it's really who you get. I could see some old crusty old dude with a bad attitude. It's, it's going to, it's, it's going to make all our sorrows look terrible. Yep. One, one small move. I, I, I lose it. I lose my shit on one kid. Um, you can't, it's just unacceptable. You cannot do that. You, you have to, um, we call it a dance when they're fighting. We, they fight every day in high school. Oh, I'm sure. But we call, we say you have to dance with them. So you don't tackle them. You don't go because all these kids got the phones anyway. Right. So you have to kind of do this dance. We call it, I call it the salsa. You just grab them and you kind of you dance with them until you can calm them down. Um, but yeah, it, it's very, very touch and go on, on so many situations. I'm all for SROs correctly doing it in the school. One of the things that I, I had a couple of investigations where high schoolers were involved and it's the sort of thing where go and talk to the good SRO and that SRO is going to, who knows the kids, knows mm-hmm. the community, knows what's going on. They're going to be able to get that person to either come out peacefully or, you know, just to talk and not elevate the threat level or anything like that, because it, it took that really good community policing. You know, even at mm-hmm. the SRO level, who knows the kids? And it was like, that was a, a huge value because if I, you know, detective so-and-so coming on scene and doesn't know this kid and pisses the kid off, well, then then there's going to be a fight or there could be violence or there could be resistance, whatever yep. the case is. Absolutely. You know, as opposed yep, to having that, that officer who knows these kids and knows what they need. And that's where it can be so effective. It, it just take I can't stress that enough. The, the, you, it's a It's a certain mind frame. I think they made the right choice in picking me and my, my other partner, Vinesy, um, because he's he's like a big kid himself. I'm like a big kid. So <laughs> it it, uh, it takes a – I could totally see the, why people would say that um, because of certain perceptions of just the old typical crusty old cop. Yeah, and I mean – and unfortunately – well, in recent events – have not helped school resource officers or school oh my police. Gosh. I mean, look at Uvalde. Oh, my gosh. That's awful. Oh, that's so, that was so hard to watch. The, the more and I more got, information that comes, I know that all cops can sit there and, you know, Monday morning quarterback it, but I just, I haven't met one that has said that, oh yeah, they did everything correctly. You know, every single one of them has thought it was just a shit show. Like this oh is my just gosh. a terrible, terrible thing. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I really never, I was so disgusted. I didn't even look at pastor. I saw that video. I didn't really research it very much, but they must not deal with many shooting calls in Uvalde or something. I don't know. It just looked like a bunch of hesitant yeah. dudes that nobody wanted to make a decision. Basic incident <laughs> command would mm-hmm. have completely, completely stopped the miscommunication. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, this that was oh. training that I got just as a road cop in incident command would have stop, you know, it would have taken care of the communication issues. It would have taken care of the interagency issues and all that type of stuff. I don't, like I said, I don't have all the facts on that. I wasn't there, you know, that it's not my, my job to critique that, but it's like, holy shit, there's, that is, that just sends the wrong message to everybody. And look at the spiral effect of what's happened of shootings in other places or not even shootings, but incidents and parents are scrambling to the schools and yeah. you know, like totally different jurisdictions in other states. And they're like, we know you guys aren't going to do anything and are trying to bust past the police. And it's like, well, time out. Like, you know, yeah, that's affected the way we've done. We've had to do the SRO because we've already experienced that. Really? Oh, yeah. One whisper, one one soft lockdown. If we have a shooting like on the same block as the school. It doesn't have to do with the school. We'll go on a soft lockdown. OK, the protocol, they have to send a message to all the parents when they okay. do that. And oh my gosh, all hell breaks loose. Really? They all want to storm the school because because of Uvalde. Y'all, Ugh. y'all ain't gonna do nothing anyway. Like, oh my gosh, yeah, they they, they caused us a lot of, of obviously first and foremost the loss of lives of the babies this comes first, but the fallout after that has been it's been a pain. And I hope that every single one of those incompetent leaders get what they deserve. Yeah, yeah, that was. It, it's the typical from what I saw the past the buck or the cover your own ass type of mentality. Oh, well, I said this and this was why I try to justify There's, There's no justifying what happened. Right. Babies were killed. And like, if I'm not, I, I look at all my students or all my babies, like right. no, nothing going to happen to them unless I'm not breathing anymore. Period. 
I'm standing in way of that. So yeah, that's, that's a tough one. That what you just said though, also resonates with me having done the job, never as an SRO, but, but the thing is though, too, that's so difficult to win the hearts and minds of those who don't believe in law enforcement and, you know, first responders as a whole is that I have no doubt that 80, 85%, maybe as high as 90 went into the profession to do good, to mm-hmm. be there for the communities, to help people. Yeah. You're going to have those per- people that just are assholes and just want to, you know, mm. fight people and, and have the power and have the authority and just want to be the, you know, be the good guy, be the hero, but in all the wrong ways, mm-hmm. you know, as, as far as not building those community relationships and all that. And it's, it's hard to, to convince the general public, like, no, 80 to 85%, maybe 90% are actually in it for the right reasons for the, the civil <laughs> servant mentality. You know, the, you're not in it for the money. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> It might be better than what you were making, but it's still not fantastic. I can guarantee that. No, no. When I started here, it was terrible. Yeah. Hey, we, we, I, I, God bless our union reps. We, we've gotten kind of up to speed with the neighboring departments. But yeah, when I started, whew, it's still more than what I was making, but it was comparable to what we were doing. No, that wasn't enough money. Yeah, no, I I see signs all over the place here that like Chick-fil-A and um, In-N-Out Burger are starting at 15 to 18 bucks an hour. It's like I I started at 18 bucks an hour as a cop. Yeah, that's exactly I started at 18 and a half. It's like I could be flipping burgers right now. Holy moly. Yeah. And the people and say thank you, you know, and they'll you know appreciate what I'm giving them. Oh my gosh, isn't that funny? When you think of what you did for 18 bucks an hour back then. Right. <laughs> but I I loved every minute of it too. You know, oh, yeah. I, I I don't appre- I don't like what what happened to me and what happened with my mentality. Again, it's one of those things that nobody prepares you for. And mm-hmm. no, no human being is, should be subjected to the types of trauma that first responders. And again, I'm talking about emergency room nurses and firefighters and EMS and everybody, the type of trauma that's just, you're exposed to on a day after day after day basis. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's not worth 18 bucks an hour. No, my gosh. And my hat's off to you, man, for, for like being transparent. Like you, no. you, you tell me like, how it ended and, and that had to have been so painful for you. Um, but like you're, you're back on your feet and you can, you can, you know, what, you can use that as a springboard to, to make even better, more change on a wider scale anyway. So I, I, I love that you, that this is what you do. I, and I appreciate that. And it's one of these things where, like I said, I've, I made the joke. I, I was fortunate enough to have the, uh, have you ever heard of, Oh no, I know you have. Cause I saw the picture of you, Sheriff Mark Lamb. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. So his number two, is Matt Thomas, the chief deputy. And I had him on my podcast just a couple months ago. Oh, and, okay. okay. Yeah, so he's a super cool dude. He just wrote a book. Um, he's a great guy. And it's the sort of thing where his agency is the one that arrested me. And he knew this a year ago when I started first talking to him, because if I'm going to have any credibility with any law enforcement officer and get people to come onto my podcast and talk about it, I have to be honest about it. I can't. Man, that's... That- that's crazy. That's that's ironic, but awesome at the same time. Yeah, it's like I can't I can't hide from it. Otherwise, I'm never going to get any credibility. I'm not going to be able to sit there mm-hmm. and say, "Don't be me." You know what I mean? Take care of your mm-hmm. mental health. Don't don't be me. Don't follow my footsteps. I want to help guide those those young bucks that are coming up. And again, I don't know what kind of service I'll be able to of the current law enforcement officer. But if if one of them just hears hears my message, that's all I care about. Is yep. just. You know, being better than what, you know, and admitting the fact that you're not perfect. Mm-hmm. And that, that's where it, it all starts is if you just swallow our pride and, and admit our faults. And I think it makes us so much more relatable. Yeah. Because that every, deep down inside, everyone knows that we're all broken in some fashion. And uh, it's, just, it's almost like, OK, I'm glad you said that. So now I can say that. So that's the mentality you got to have. They, they I remember, need, they, uh, go ahead. Sorry. The, that that guy, I have to, I have to look into uh, the, uh, Sheriff Lamb's underboss to check him out. He is on one of your podcasts recently. Yep, very recently. His name's uh, Chief, or it's Matt Thomas with Pinal County Sheriff's Office. And I said he just wrote a book too uh, called Interceptors. Matt, I'm uh, I'm getting some royalties from this if you sell any books. Um, ah, okay, I got you. Yeah, but he just he just <laughs> uh, uh, wrote a book called uh, Interceptors, and it's about like because we're a border state. So mm-hmm. being a border state, like I worked criminal interdiction for years and doing drug loads, human smuggling loads, human trafficking loads, you know, uh, uh, identity theft and all that type of stuff. And he also – his county, Pinal County, that's actually the county I live in, um, it doesn't touch the border directly, but it's very short drive and it's where 80 percent of mm-hmm. all the drugs are coming into the country. 
So Ugh. there's there's all the fentanyl. I mean, not all, but a large portion of the fentanyl coming into this country is coming through Arizona, coming through Pinal County into Phoenix, where it then goes out to the the, the bigger mm. distribution across the country. Is, is I have to ask, is fentanyl as big of an issue where you are as it is where we are? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they're, they're dropping dead. As of about two years ago, it, I mean, it's all the time. I've lost several people that I'm close to that I know no. very well. Yeah. My buddy Stryker just died about a month ago. Um, yeah, because I've, I've actually got, grew a huge connection with a lot of the the addict the addict uh, crowd around here because I I love them too. I help. I try to help them out. I try to give them the same thing I give my boys at my group. So uh, a lot of them come to me for help um, and just to uh, uh, advice and stuff how to get clean. And there's a lot of good programs now, but yeah, a lot of them have been touched by that fentanyl stuff, the devil. It, it is absolutely the worst stuff on the planet. And Matt and I had talked about the fact of I'm not scared of my son going to a party and trying drugs and then maybe using drugs. I'm scared of my son now going out to a party, taking one pill and dying. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's like the first time that, that people are dropping dead on the first time. And it's terrible. And not that yep. my son goes to parties and does drugs. That's not what I'm saying, but you know, it's just insane the the power that that stuff has. It is it is uncanny. It, it's so heartbreaking, and yeah, it's awful. Dude, I appreciate your time. I don't want to take up your entire morning. You're out. You're out in your community doing great things. I would love to continue our conversation. We have have some more time and Absolutely. sit down and chat and have have more of a formal conversation. Yep. You want to um. You want you want to do the podcast at a certain um. Another time, whatever you want, whatever your availability is. Like you said, I don't want to. You're you're doing great things out in the community. I just wanted to touch base and talk. And like I said, and I, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind putting this up and posting this initial conversation because I think it's oh, a that's great fine conversation. with me. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. fine awesome. with me. I was just going to say, like, we can do this and then the podcast, or we we can set something up. Whatever you want, brother. I like. I we, I made a connection with you right away. I was just watching your stuff. Yeah, heck yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on this guy's show. Awesome, for sure. Awesome. Yeah, and I and I just like talking. I like talking to yep, great, I, interesting people. Man, we have a lot in common. I'm sure we could talk for eight hours. We could right? make a make a two day podcast if we if we had the time. That's the one thing when I started doing the podcast is like I've never done anything like this before. It was just it literally again. I I'm open to the fact that I'm a cannabis consumer. Shoot, I've got a Arizona normal expensive <laughs> shirt on. Like I'm a cannabis consumer, and I was using because and also the, the one thing for me is, is I have herniated discs in my back and uh, physical therapy and. I've already had mm -hmm. one failed surgery and all that. And it just came to me and I never thought or realized, and I'm sure like when you, you're making your videos, it's fun. Yeah. It's like, it's like, I didn't yeah. realize that this is a thing that would be fun to do. Yeah. And people respond to it. you get one response. That's fuel enough. Like, man, yep. I'm, somebody's, somebody's actually being encouraged by what I'm saying. Let me keep doing this. Even if it's just one person, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yep. And they I, don't. I've seen you going and bugging your, uh, your fellow coworkers too. About oh, the yeah, uh, crazy funny. sock day or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. I'm just a class clown over there most of the time. That's awesome. <laughs> no, yeah, let's let's set something up formally. Like I said, where you're not in your car and we can just have more conversation, man. I'd love to do that. Yep, just hit me up, man. I'm here. I'll, I'll, I'll just give me a time and I'll we'll, we'll get it done. Uh, what's your social medias? Uh, it is Detective Matt Forty Five Thornton. You want me just I, my email out to you? Well, I just but said so that a, people that oh, see for this, the, yeah, for right. yeah, they can okay, start. Where, um, Detective Matt Forty Five Thornton is my TikTok. Um, my Matt, I think it's the same. Yeah, Detective Matt Forty Five Thornton is my YouTube. Okay. And okay. Uh, Facebook, my father's business. And that's your organization, my father's business. Yep, that's my organization. Yep, okay. it's all connected. Yep. Awesome. Matt, thank you so much. Like I said, I, I, I'm not the kitschy like, all right, everybody. Thank you so much. No, man. No, I've, I've enjoyed this conversation and I would love to continue it at a better time. For sure, my brother. You're out, doing, you're out doing the good Lord's work for your community. So keep it up, man. I appreciate it. All right. Yeah. Just hit me up anytime. Just shoot me out. I'll, I'll uh, on the email, I'll shoot you my phone number. Okay. I think you did send it to me on, on message. So. Oh, okay, cool. Okay. I got you. All right, brother. You stay freaking safe out there, man. And you're doing amazing I work will, out there man. in the community. You too. I look forward. All right, brother. Talk to you soon. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye.